Hello, everybody, and welcome in to another episode of the Couch GM's podcast. It is Tuesday, September 20th, 2022, and I'm your host, George Kurt, joined by the hot takes man himself, Tyler Snyder. Tyler, how was your week two? Look, man, week two was um, interesting so far, but <laughs> yeah. fantastic for a hot takes guy. I mean, I've been throwing out nothing but the hottest of takes all off season, and people are like, you're crazy. Meanwhile... It's just nothing but madness going on in the NFL, and nobody can explain it. The only way those things ever happen is if hot takes are hitting. So uh, it's it's a good season for me. It really is. And I mean, I feel like even some of the more outlandish stuff I've said have hit. This has been a very interesting first two weeks. Um, but today on the show, let's hit some uh, NFL news and notes. We're going to talk quotes of the week. We're going to hit the waiver wire. And speaking of those hot takes, we're going to see who we should be hitting the panic button on. And we're going to preview Thursday Night Football for next week, which is a good old divisional matchup of Steelers and Browns. Make sure you find us on thecouchgms.com, our social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at the Couch GMs, And join our Discord chat. The link is in the description of the podcast or video you are watching. Let's jump into NFL news. All right, not a lot of NFL news here to hit, but the big one. 49ers quarterback Trey Lance unfortunately broke his ankle in their game on Sunday and he is going to miss the rest of the season after he had successful surgery on Monday. Honestly, super sad to see a guy who was finally getting his first shot to start in the NFL and it gets cut short only in week two. What do you think, Tyler? You know, it's, I I look at it two ways. Um, One, it is depressing for Trey Lance. It, it sucks. Um, but you got to remember that guys can bounce back from this. I mean, look at Joe Burrow, look at Dak Prescott, look what they did after they came back from horrific leg injuries. Um, they just excelled. Um, definitely hate to see this when he finally got a shot, but luckily he's young enough that he's going to continue to get his shot down the line. Um, but I actually, I, I don't like that this happened. Don't get me wrong, but I, I like that Jimmy Garoppolo's getting one last chance. Um, I, I think the guy you know, has been solid. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's done anything to deserve to lose his job. He just, you know, wasn't as good as what they're hoping Trey Lance would be. Um, So he got benched and now he gets his chance to lead the team one last time. And, you know, maybe this is, he he didn't get the off season he was hoping to get. He didn't get the trade offers he was hoping to get. Maybe this will be one last audition for him um, and maybe earn a permanent role somewhere else. And I think the big reason why he's still on the 49ers is because his contract still doesn't expire till the end of this year. Now, like you said, this year is his audition. He's going to be an actual free agent. There's no more jumping through trade hoops to try to get him to another team. Um, so if they do decide Trey Lance is really the future, if Jimmy Garoppolo gets him how far but not far enough or whatever the situation is, we can talk about that all later into the season and the offseason. Um they can cut ties with Jimmy Garoppolo after the season now. But I'm also kind of glad you brought up, you know, some of the like football or fantasy side of it, because I actually want to say as bad as this sounds for Trey Lance, I, I give everyone on the 49ers a very slight bump with Jimmy Garoppolo. Slightly more consistent passer. I like Ayuk and Debo better now. Um, the running backs are going to get more carries as opposed to Trey Lance, you know, stealing a couple of those carries. So Jeff Wilson gets a little bit of a bump. Tyrion Davis Price was a red zone guy this past week. He gets a slight bump. Um, so like it's it's just going to be a slightly different style of offense. I don't think it's going to be any better or worse, but it's going to be better, I think, for fantasy if you're an owner of some of those skill position players on San Francisco. Absolutely, absolutely, and you know Trey Lance also. Maybe he wasn't ready. Like, I I don't know about you, man, but I, from watching everything, like, I understand he played in the rain in week one, and it was only wait, week one, really. He didn't get much of a chance in week two. But I wasn't impressed still. I wasn't impressed last season. I wasn't impressed yet this year. Um, again, I understand that he played in the rain, and, you know, he didn't – he struggled in year one, but – Justin Fields played in the rain and struggled in year one, and yet he pulled out the victory on him in week one. So I wasn't thrilled with him yet. Maybe this will give him a chance to really, you know, do some studying in the offseason, help him come back even better. Um, But it's not the only news from week one, so I think that's enough on Trey Lance. Um, If you're in a two-quarterback league, maybe you need to go snag Jimmy Garoppolo with Trey Lance and 
Dak Prescott being some of the names that are going down and other quarterbacks struggling across the league. You got, you know, Tom Brady, Joe Burrows looked rough, Russell Wilson, um, Matt Ryan, not, we won't even go there. I, I, I love to say I told you so, but moving on, uh, let's go on to Mike Evans, uh, got in a brawl and he is suspended for one game. Um, because of the fight that he had in New Orleans. He is expected to appeal, so maybe he will still play this upcoming week based off of how the appeal goes. But, George, I did see one tweet on Twitter that uh, really it made me laugh. It said, find you some friends that will stick up for you the way the Buccaneers stick up for Tom Brady. Because if you watch that clip... It's Tom Brady talking smack. Marshawn Lattimore is talking smack to everyone. Tom Brady's the one that's going back at him. And as soon as you approach Brady, here comes players out of the woodworks to stick up for Brady. He never had to throw a punch. Um, those are the kinds of friends you need to have. And if I'm not mistaken, I saw his tweet come out yesterday. So soon after it happened, that was like trying to read the lips of Mike Evans talking to the official when he got ejected. And he was like something to the extent of, what the F am I supposed to do? That's Tom Brady. Like, so exactly right along with you. Like these guys are bought in and props. Cause I feel like anybody, any quarterback, especially that can have the kind of street cred in the locker room to have everyone jump up and protect him. Even if it's him talking smack to another guy, maybe Mike Evans went too far. He probably did. And especially cause he's suspended now one game. Cause he's a repeat offender. He had another suspension worthy action like this i want to say in 2019 um which is why he's now getting the one game suspension but that props to them for standing up for tom brady yeah absolutely and hey (laughs) find you some friends that'll do that um but you do need to tamper expectations i mean fantasy impact on this uh obviously if you have mike evans you're going to be missing him for a game most likely based off of when the suspension is whether it's this week or the following week um you could say it's an increase to his other receivers, but what other receivers? His other receivers are <laughs> all hurt, <laughs> all injured and struggling. And, you know, if somebody comes back from injury next week and Mike Evans is out, that is some potential uptick. Uh, Mike Evans is a touchdown maniac. So you'd think the touchdowns are going to go elsewhere. You could try to look at, you know, maybe the tight ends, but I don't see it. I think uh, if anybody's going to have an uptick in tight ends, it's going to be Leonard Fournette. Um but I really think like shade away from Brady. Do not play him uh, if Mike Evans is out, especially with all these other injuries. Um, it's not the time. He clearly struggled not having his receivers. Um, we got to see Grumpy Brady all game, which is my favorite character in the NFL. <laughs> um, we got to see him from the first opening kickoff. It was Grumpy Brady time. So mm-hmm. bench Brady, honestly, shy away from all your bucks except Fournette. Uh, there's one receiver if I'm absolutely desperate, which I, again, it probably ended up falling similar like I was talking about at Devin DuVernay last week. Like you add him, you probably don't play him because you have better options. Rashad Perryman. Because it seems like the one guy that keeps stepping up when all these guys are out is Rashad Perryman. He caught a touchdown this week, but I don't love that either. I'm pretty much not playing any bucks except for Leonard Fournette. And you know what? Nobody likes a jerk in fantasy, <laughs> but... Jerks win championships. I'm just saying it. Um, Take advantage of your league. If you have a group full of people that might not be as strong with football or maybe don't follow it as much, take advantage of them. Who cares? We're not out there to help them win. You're out there to help yourself win. Go pick up a guy like Brashad Perryman if he is going to be the number one receiver. Let him have this randomly good game. You're not going to start him because you're not going to trust Brashad Perryman. But if he does go out there and put up 15, 20 points because he's the number one, trade him to some sorry sucker that doesn't realize he's going to be a fourth string receiver in a few weeks and get some good return out of it. Uh, You know, take advantage of your league mates. I mean, I know nobody likes a jerk, but jerks win championships, so do it. I mean, it's good advice to help win a championship, but I think that's all the news we have for today. I'm kind of surprised, but we have more to talk about here. Why don't we jump some quotes of the week? Quotes of the week first takes us to a struggling Cincinnati Bengals team where head coach Zach Taylor was talking about the 0-2 start in his postgame press conference. He said, I think we've given up too many sacks. Absolutely. We've given ourselves an opportunity to win these games against good teams. So once things settle down, I know that we're going to be a really good football team. I mean, the Bengals have been rough. Do you really think they're going to turn this around or is this 0-2 more the reality? 
Yeah, this reminds me a lot of the Bengals from Joe Burrow's first season. In his first season, the Bengals showed these flashes where you're like, wow, this team has potential. This team could be really good really quickly, but they gave up so many sacks. Burrow was always under duress, and it ended up getting Burrow hurt. Um, And then, you know, they come back last year, and, you know, Burrow killed it. They actually protected him a little bit. They ended up making it all the way to the Super Bowl, shocked some teams. Granted, they beat the Titans, even though the Titans sacked them nine times in a game. We're not going to talk about that part. Um, But it it goes to show the potential they do have. But if you can't protect your quarterback, I don't care who it is. You know, we just watched the Packers play Sunday Night Football. And Aaron Rodgers is one of the greatest quarterbacks in the league. And you can say whatever you want about his receivers being trash or anything. But... In the first half, the Packers' O-line was not giving him any time. Their run game was killing it. But the second he would drop back to pass, he was getting hit. And Aaron Rodgers looked like trash in the first half because he didn't have a chance to throw it. So if one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time is going to struggle because he doesn't have time, Joe Burrow is not going to go out there and crush it either. So I feel bad for Joe Burrow. I, I hate the hate that's going towards Burrow right now. Like, give the man some protection. And he can actually do something. Make a trade. Make a trade. Like, you know what I would love to see? And I I don't know the logistics of this. I don't know how the cap would work. I don't know what options are even out there. But this is just, you know, couch GM spitballing here. (laughs) I'd love to see Tyler Boyd traded for a top offensive lineman. You can still live with Jamar Chase and T. Higgins and Joe Mixon. And they got some other young guys that could step up into that number three role and be solid. Um, or you could even hit the free agency. You got Odell Beckham later in the season or Will Fuller now uh, as potential guys now, Um, or even a Cole Beasley. You have options. Go trade Tyler Boyd to a team that needs a receiver. You'd get some damn good return and get a good offensive lineman. Get someone that's actually going to protect Burrow. Uh, That's the move I would like to see. Yo, actually, you said that. Could you imagine Cole Beasley as a slot threat on that offense with those two burners on the outside? That'd be something, actually. Um, He'd be solid, yeah. man. He'd be solid. Yeah, but no, I'm 100% with you. And, like, they tried to revamp their offensive line this offseason, and it looks just as bad or worse than last year. Like, his rookie season, he got his knee ripped up because they couldn't protect him. They couldn't get through the playoffs in the Super Bowl just on his magic. Like they got to the Super Bowl and lost because he was running around for his life the whole time. And it just looks like a repeat again. I do give them credit for trying to help, but they didn't help. So like if they want to keep this window open, they definitely have to go find him more help. And as a couch GM, just kind of spitball. And I think that's the greatest thing I've ever heard out of this whole thing. So they, 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 Tyler Boyd's nice to have, but Tyler Boyd is not necessary with all the other stuff they have around there. No, he's extra in that yeah. offense. And, you know, we are a fantasy podcast, so talking enough about the actual team, talking fantasy-wise, uh, the things you need to note here are Joe Burrow is a bit of a sketchy play right now because he's running for his life. The only redeeming factor is he is getting these garbage time points at the end of the game because he's able to just hurl it up and hope. Um, and it's been working, but that's not always going to work until the Bengals can find some way to make this offense work with that garbage line or they get a replacement. You might want to look for a different quarterback if Burrow's your number one. Um, as far as the receivers, look, garbage time or not, these receivers are getting it done. Jamar Chase, you're going to play him every week. I don't care how bad the Bengals look. You play him every week. Joe Mixon, you're playing him every week. I don't care how bad they look. Um so that's really the fantasy aspect that you need to look at it. Um, but George, that is not our only quote of the week. We got two more to go. So let's hit the next one. All right. We're going to go to Atlanta where head coach Arthur Smith is talking a little bit of Kyle Pitts. Uh, I'm sure we're going to talk a little more Kyle Pitts later, but we'll hit it now. Uh, he said, Kyle is a huge part of our offense. You just have to take it with context. The other guys made plays. It's not fantasy football. We're just trying to win. We'll continue to look at everything and try to get better. <sighs> Hey, it is fantasy football. I know, right? What are you talking about? Everything's fantasy football. All our fantasy owners here are freaking out. Like, come on, get Kyle Pitts some touches. And the Falcons literally just said, we don't care. Which I expect, but. (laughs) And that's that's the realism we need to get as fans. Like, as much as we're watching the TV going, why aren't you throwing it to him? He's the best guy on the team. Like, maybe the team has different plans. And if it's working for them, then it's working for them. And you might be thinking, well, it's not working for them. They're 0-2. 
they are supposed to be 0 and 2 and they were in two damn close games yeah they were they almost won in week <laughs> one against the saints they were this close to beating the la rams mm-hmm. the super bowl champs in week two with mariota a rookie quarterback and a bunch of scrubs nobody knows who is alamedi zacchaeus no one cares who <laughs> alamedi zacchaeus is i know he's been okay for a couple years no one cares all right and yet that team is performing well so whatever they're doing whether it you know, Kyle Pitts is mainly a decoy now, or they get him involved later. Whatever they're doing is helping them to actually be competitive in games. And as much as it sucks as fans, we need to appreciate that. And we just need to be able to bounce around around that. So maybe Kyle Pitts isn't your starter. Maybe he is moving forward. That sounds like a question for the couch GMs. And that's why you listen to this podcast. And that's why we're going to help you all season long. And continue to say that the best player on that team for fantasy is a 30-year-old wide receiver playing running back. I will not get over that. Uh, But that's how it's going right now. Uh, But a little fun to end our quotes of the week here. Uh, The quote is literally five, four, three, two, one. And that was the Broncos fans, after even more delay of game penalties, trying to count out the play clock to their offense it gets bad when the fans are counting down the play clock. I may have never seen this bad of coaching in my life. I I have, I don't know anything about Nathaniel Hackett. I don't know his background. I don't know how good he was previously coming into this. Um, But I hate the way he's coaching. Um, I've never disliked a head coach so much in my life watching these games. It's, frustrating you pay all this money to go out and get russell wilson yet you don't trust them to get five yards you trust your kicker to get a 64 yard field goal more than you trust your quarterback to get five yards this man is absolutely terrified terrified of using timeouts it's (laughs) insane to me and he's allergic to the end zone There's a clip on social media of Peyton Manning during Monday Night Football Manning cast uh, in week one where he says timeout on screen. I think it was 42 times because he's trying to say, like, (laughs) call a timeout. Like, it's obvious. Like, do it. And they just don't. And then you have, you know, this week, I think there was like 20 seconds left in the half. And they were within field goal range, but like long field goal range. And he ran the offense out there, then ran the kicker out there, then thought about it again. It wasn't sure. And ended up deciding they wanted to kick the field goal, but took so long trying to make a decision and didn't call any of his three timeouts he had with 20 seconds left that they got a delay of game penalty, which pushed them back five yards and they had to punt in a game they were losing by I think nine, like it would have made it a one score game at the time. It's absolutely laughable. Like I have seen six year olds playing Madden that know how to do this better than Nathaniel Hackett is right now. And it's scary. It pains me to see because the Broncos who some people were talking about as a potential Super Bowl team or this like really good team for this year, solid, like offensive dominant team. The coaching is holding them back. The coaching is horrendous, and it's making their offensive studs sketchy fantasy plays. Man, I don't know. There's not a lot I want to play on that team right now because of it. There's still yards to go around because getting yards does not seem to be their problem. It's just they're getting into deep field goal range and somehow screwing it up. They're getting down into and goal situations and can't get it in the end zone with Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams. Like, If you told me that, like, Seattle was having problems getting in the end zone, number one with their sketchy offense, number two with Rashad Penny and a rookie, I'd be like, yeah, I could see that. Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon are two of the better running backs in the league, in my opinion, and they can't score in and goal situations. I don't don't get exactly what's happening. The coaching is absolutely maddening on that team, but there's still points to go around, so I'm sure we're going to talk more Broncos as we get towards our panic button segment, but, like, Just kind of like play with caution as you're going forward with them. I expect it to get better. It's a rookie coach. It should start like if he does some film study on himself, it should get better. But there's no guarantees for that. 
I think it was blatantly obvious to see the timeout issues from week one. Mm-hmm. So to see the ex- and the delay of game issues from week one and to see the exact same issues in week two means he is not correcting it yet. And in this kind of league, like, yes, you, they ended up pulling out the win in week two. They're one and one. It should be an easy two and zero start for them. It should be, but it's not. It's one and one and barely like they're lucky to have the one win. In this kind of a league, you can't wait till week four, five, six to finally figure out what you're doing wrong and fix it. Like, you need to do it immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other quote that I heard from Broncos fans, if you want to call it a quote, I mean, <laughs> not really, was booing. <laughs> booing Nathaniel Hackett and already booing Russell Wilson. They go out, get pay all this to get Russell, and the Broncos fans were booing Russell in the middle of the game. Like, it's... Rough start, my guy. Rough start. But, you know, that's enough for the quotes of the week, George. We are a fantasy podcast. Some people need to go out and fix their team after a rough week, too. So uh, why don't we go ahead and move on to our waiver wire segment? Yes, we're going to hit the waiver wire here going into week three. So as a reminder, as always, go check out thecouchgms.com where I posted our waiver wire column for the week. I'll go ahead and hit the guys that we have on that article. We can talk a little more if you want to. And then I want to give a couple more guys you should look at as we go forward, just to give you a little bit extra to go into the next week. So in the article, I talk about Raheem Mostert, who running back for the Dolphins, uh, Daryl Williams, who's now on the Cardinals, and Eno Benjamin as well. Uh, There's an injury to James Conner you have to kind of watch out for as we go forward. Garrett Wilson's my favorite out of the week. He exploded for the Jets this week. Uh, Jacoby Myers, who I'm actually going to come back to in a second. Sterling Shepard, who's emerging as the number one for the Giants. Maybe not really fantastic, but you never really know. Um, And then my streaming defense to look at is the Eagles as they have two good matchups coming up in the next two weeks. Um, It doesn't really matter to me. Like We haven't seen Monday Night Football yet. Even if they fall apart on Monday Night Football, I still like the Eagles defense to start the next two weeks. But... Uh, I'll get us kicked off with some extra guys because I know a lot of people out there are probably going to say, why are you spotlighting Jacoby Myers and not Nelson Aguilar? They're both wide receivers for the New England Patriots. Aguilar had 20 fantasy points and half PPR. And it's not because I'm an Eagles fan. I knew you were going to chuckle because you said that. Nelson Aguilar had six ca- six catches on six targets, but a lot of them, like you can't really trust the deep touchdown as being something that's consistent in fantasy football. Jacoby Myers had more than double the targets of Nelson Aguilar this week. He still scored more than 10 points. He had 13 targets. So like, I like going out there and finding the volume monster because I feel like that is the more sustainable option in fantasy as opposed to going chasing Nelson Aguilar for the 17th time in our fantasy careers. (laughs) Look, I think Nelson Aguilar is better than people give him credit for um, personally. However, um, Yes, I agree. Jacoby Myers is the number one running back or number one receiver for that team. Um, He's going to get the targets. Uh, The thing is, I don't really love the Patriots offense enough to be like Aguilar or Jacoby Myers should be my number one target. Um, However, I do think they are both solid options. Maybe you need a streamer. We do have bye weeks coming up very shortly. We have injuries starting already. Uh, We have some wide receivers that are absolutely putting up duds that we expect the big things from. So um, maybe you do need to go out and grab somebody and you could do worse than Jacoby Myers um, or Nelson Aguilar, who is the first person on our extra segment here. But George did kind of talk about him already a little bit. So I'm going to move on to our next guy. Um, Which, by the way, Garrett Wilson is also my favorite from your segment. Mm -hmm. I highlighted him last week and said that I thought he was going to be big and um, because you and Cody were talking Elijah Moore. I said I expected big things from Garrett Wilson. Cody kind of shrugged it off. So, ha, Cody, hot takes guy wins again. (laughs) Um, Anyway, my guy is Brian Robinson. Now, this guy should Mm -hmm. not be available. He is only 42.5% owned in NFL fantasy leagues, but he shouldn't be available. If you have an IR spot on your league, uh, he should have been owned this entire time, stashed him. Cool. Um, However, if you don't have an IR spot and he would take up a roster spot, now's your time. Go snag him. Go pick him up. He is going to miss four games because he is on the IR, but we are already through week two. It's only two games to go, and he's already practicing with the team which means he is looking good to come back week five. Now, Antonio Gibson has looked pretty good, 
uh, so far. However, I think the team has shown time and time again that they do not want Antonio Gibson as their number one. And Brian Robinson is a really exciting rookie. So now's your time. Go get Brian Robinson. Especially in the leagues where you can stash somebody on injured reserve. I have no idea how he's more than 50% available. And the other thing I will back that up with is if he comes back and plays week five and does not play many snaps or doesn't play well, hold him for an extra week. Don't jump off the ship too fast because, I mean, this man just came back from that severe leg injury and he could get eased back in, especially with Antonio Gibson playing decent. But I'm with you. I don't see many scenarios by the end of the year where he is not the main running back in that split for Washington. And they are a solid rushing offense. Absolutely. They absolutely are. George, you got anybody else for me? I do. I'm going to go to the quarterback position because we've talked about so many struggling quarterbacks and we haven't even gotten to the panic button segment yet. Jimmy Garoppolo. We did talk about him a little bit already, but I mean, Trey Lance got hurt. Russell Wilson struggling. Tom Brady. Um, Joe Burrow is not having like the, the start we expected. Jimmy Garoppolo has done it before. He was never like the best quarterback option, but if you are in trouble, go out and grab him. He can probably still get you that like 16 to 20 points a game. I expect San Francisco's offense to be even more efficient without Trey Lance with Jimmy Garoppolo in there. And he's only 1.6% owned. So you can get him pretty much everywhere. Yeah. And you know what? Another quarterback, since we're on it, like the, we got to mention the man, the Madden player. He is Uh Tua Tonga Vailoa. Look, Okay. I don't do this a lot on this podcast. You actually said his last name. Is that the thing you don't do much? No. The thing I don't do much on this podcast is apologize. I apologize because I talked so much smack about Tua. I said that, you know, I think he's going to have a rough season. I think he's going to be one of the worst um, quarterbacks this year because I watched him in person and he's trash. Now, he is 66% rostered. So he's not available in a ton of leagues, but that still leaves um, 34% out there that he is available in and math. the dude put up 41 points in week two. Yes. 13.8 <laughs> in week one against a tough defense. And he does have some tough defenses coming up as well with Buffalo and Cincinnati. But then he follows that up with the jets. He's got Detroit coming up, Cleveland coming up. You know, he's got some decent matchups and he's got the weapons. The dude doesn't even look good throwing. I'm not going to lie. I watched him put up 41 points. He just kind of like wings it, but We've watched Tyreek Hill for years just run underneath the ball when he winks it, and that's what he's doing for <laughs> Tua now. And Tua's putting up points, so go look at Tua, man. Like, pick him up. Uh, he is 66% owned, but if he is available, go get him. Uh, one more guy, quick. Um, Hold on one sec. Who is also... If you're worried about the way he's looking when he's throwing, we watched how many years of irrelevant Phillip Rivers, so don't worry about that. <laughs> Now imagine Philip Rivers was a lefty, and that's kind of what it looks like—a lefty with better with better mobility. Like he's not really the most yes. mobile, but the dude can get a couple rushing yards. <laughs> like he can run, but yeah. he doesn't have to because no. his receivers are so open. <laughs> uh, one other guy who is heavily owned, but I just want to like remind you guys in case you haven't picked him up yet. I don't know what you're waiting for. Curtis Samuel, go get this dude. What are you waiting for? Uh, the guy put up. 15 points in week one, 19 points in week two. Like the guy is proving he is a go-to get. Um, We call it the red matchups when they have a tough matchup or against a top 10 team against that position. Uh, He has one, two, three, four matchups in a row that are not red matchups before he finally gets to one. He's got some good um, potential out there. Carson Wentz is slinging it. Maybe not well, but he's slinging it and he's getting it there to somebody. So (laughs) Go get Curtis Samuel if he's still available. What are you waiting for? I'll take some credit for that one because I did have him in my column last week and he followed it right back up with an even better game. So I'll take that. Um, I'm going to move us to running backs here again really quick. Uh, Mark Ingram, back up for Alvin Kamara in New Orleans. We don't know what the extent of the injury is. I feel like we didn't know about the injury going through the waiver process last week. He did play. Ingram didn't do fantastic, but... If he's a starting running back, he needs to be at least owned, and he can be an emergency starter if you need an emergency flex, if you have an injury at the position, even if you're just trying to fill in for Kamara. So I'm just having him on here just because he might not be the best play. He has a good chance to get you 10 if you need it. Absolutely. Yeah, I I completely agree. Um, We do have some tight ends on this list. Evan Engram is one of the options out there. 
Uh, we've been waiting years for him to be good. At least he's finally doing something. But the guy I want to highlight, because I highlighted him before, I'm going to highlight him again. It's Hayden Hurst uh, for the Bengals. I never liked him before he was on the Bengals. I didn't think he was going to be that thrilling this year, but I watched how much the Bengals are forcing it to him in the key situations where they need a catch. And the dude looks tough. I don't know. He's hitting people and then like getting over top of them like a big t- macho man. I'm like, you're hating her. Shut up. Like, I don't know what you're doing. He's he's out there running people over like Derrick Henry and just it's crazy. I, I like to see it. Hayden Hurst is performing very well. Um, if you are in a league where you need a tight end dart throw, go get him. Like Hayden Hurst is a good option. Um, I know on last week's show, I said, go drop Mike Gusecki, pick up Hayden Hurst. And I know Mike Gusecki broke 10 this week because he had a touchdown. He did nothing else. So don't come at me, people. I still think Gusecki shouldn't be owned. Hayden Hurst should be owned more than him. So uh, go get Hayden Hurst. Yeah, I'm with you. I just I threw Evan Ingram on here because he had a decent game, and I feel like everyone's always like jumping right back on the Evan Ingram train. And the dude has the physical ability to be so good and just never puts it together. He's frustrating. But because of that, you kind of have to just kind of keep an eye on him. Um, I'd want to see two or three weeks of him doing that before he actually comes back and, you know, becomes relevant on my fantasy, my tight end dartboard. But Hayden Hurst, as much as he's not scoring many points, I like the fact that they're trying to get him used in that offense in Cincinnati. So I like that pick there. Um, another guy who it's like, why the heck are you on here? Nico Collins. I mean, I guess we did talk a little bit of Nico Collins near the end of the off season. Um, but this man, well, I just had some audio in my, uh, my ear here. It's really throwing me off. Okay, here we go. I was pulling up some ESPN stats for this week. We talk about Brandon Cooks as being the guy who is like Mr. Consistency. He'll get you 10 points, but he's not going to get you any more. We might have two of them in, in Houston now. And Nico Collins is the other one. He matched Brandon Cooks stats almost exactly this week. He had one less target, 10 for Brandon Cooks, nine for Nico Collins. Maybe that's just going to hurt both of them in the long run, but we expect some progression out of Davis Mills. This offense has been a lot more consistent than it was a year ago. So there's a chance we have another guy who's just like, oh, if you need a bye week fill, throw out Nico Collins. He's got you 10 points. It's fine. Yeah, and, you know, Brandon Cooks has been a little disappointing this year. He, ha- I mean, he's made some big plays, but he hasn't quite lived up to what we've been expecting. So, you know, if he's going to leave a void, then, you know, Nico Collins might be the guy to step up and take those points that Cooks is leaving out there. Um, All right, guys. You know, if you have any other questions on – um some waivers anybody else you are wondering hey should i pick this guy up or should i pick this guy up over this guy reach out to us let us know um but it is time to move on if you're anything like me uh you see some players start putting up some duds you start shaking a little bit you start sweating a little bit you're like oh crap did i draft the wrong guy can i even start this guy anymore should i cut him should i cut this early round pick it is time should we hit the panic button Are we going to panic? Are we not? It's time for the panic button segment. I feel like I have not been more hyped to intro a segment than that in my whole entire life. So like, you're going to have to take over that one. It's all you, Um, but yes, we're hitting the panic button. Are we not hitting the panic button? Let's start off with quarterbacks. We talked plenty of them, but we're going to hit one of them on this segment and it's Russell Wilson. I'm going to let you start here, Mr. Hype. Russell Wilson, are we hitting the panic button? All right, guys. So Russell Wilson has been disappointing. Put up some garbage time points this past week, so kind of salvaged it a little bit. Um, Look, he's a great quarterback. He's got the mobility. He's got the arm. He's got the receivers around. Oh, does he? Jerry Judy got hurt this past week. We're not sure of the full extent of his injury just yet. Uh, He did lose Tim Patrick for the season. He's got Cortland Sutton, but he's got one receiver. Uh, We saw Kendall Hinton making catches. Like, who? Like, isn't he the emergency quarterback? Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Yeah, I think he is. Like, they got these random guys having to step up because they're already catching the injury bug. And the other thing is the play calling, the coaching. Like, yes, he can get the yards. There's plenty of yards there, like we said earlier. But touchdowns are a big thing, especially in if you're in one of those leagues where the scoring is heavily dominated by touchdowns. Um, 
I'm saying hit the panic button on Russell Wilson. Absolutely hit it. However, I'm not saying drop him. We're not panicking that hard. I'm saying bench him. I look for another option at quarterback, somebody else, maybe stream some quarterbacks here and there. If Russ has a good matchup, maybe we try him again. But until the Broncos prove that they know how to football, I'm not starting Russell Wilson again. I'm getting somebody else in there for now. Hit the panic button. All right. I feel like I have to give a little bit of say here. So... I was one of the people that was probably even higher than the Broncos on most. I mean, you're going to say, oh, yeah, you had him winning the Super Bowl. I said they'd be a Super Bowl contender with a quarterback. Russell Wilson was the quarterback or supposed to be the guy. But I don't know if it's all him. Like, we talked for probably longer than we had to at the beginning of this, of this show about how bad their play calling looks, how bad their time management looks, how about their coaching in general looks right now. And you have to hope it's going to get a little better. But we don't know if it's going to for sure. This is still obviously a team that could run the ball a lot, too. I talked so high on Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon. These two might start getting more, you know, prominent roles in the offense, especially if you're going to see Jerry Judy miss any time, which I'm not really quite sure he's going to, but we don't know. Um, Cortland Sutton is starting to look like his old self, but if he's going to have to keep throwing the ball to Kendall Hinton, uh, I don't love it. So my hand is right over the panic button, but I'm – Going to hold off for one more week. If I see him scoring less than 15 again next week, I'm slamming that button. All right, so there you have it for Russell Wilson. Uh, you know, we that was a fan question, by the way, on should we panic on Russell Wilson. So thank you so much for the question. Uh, moving ahead, we got Rashad Penny was projected to be the starter for the Seahawks. The dude had like seven points in week one, one in week two. Yikes. Um, Rashad Penny. Look, I wasn't thrilled with him in the start of the season. He looked great last year to end the season. Cool. I don't care. Uh, it's not last season anymore. It's this season. And I I didn't like him to begin with. He's not performing very well. And you know what? The Seahawks, George, uh, clarify something for me. Are they still starting Geno Smith? Unfortunately, yes. Oh, no, yep, panic. No, nope, <laughs> panic button. Geno Smith is the starting quarterback. Uh, no, I'm panic button. I'm not going to be playing him because, look, what's going to happen is Geno's going to throw 87 picks a game because he's garbage. Uh, the Seahawks are going to fall behind in games when they're not playing dumb teams like the Broncos who don't know how to football yet. And when you fall behind in a game, what you do is you abandon the run. Uh, Kenneth Walker is there taking some carries. Uh, they also got, uh, what's the other dude? Uh, Travis Homer. Travis Homer's been stealing some carries. Uh, random running backs are standing uh, stealing carries from a team that's already going to abandon the run in the second half anyway. Panic. Put Penny on your bench. Don't drop him. Put Penny on your bench. I pretty much have to agree with you. I'm him in the panic button. Rashad panic. Penny. <laughs> Rashad Penny was somebody who, after you saw how the whole thing with Kenneth Walker was going in the preseason where he had to get that sports hernia surgery and you knew that he was most likely not going to play week one, it was like Rashad Penny is the guy that has the chance to take this role and run with it. If he has a really good week one and a really good week two, they could stick with the hot hand and go with it. Week one, not great. Week two immediately gets just about as many carries as Walker and Homer. Like, they're jumping off that bandwagon as fast as we should be jumping off that bandwagon. I'm with Tyler. Don't drop him yet. He's still somebody that has enough volume that, like, maybe he could turn it around. But do not start him. Moving right along, we got Travis Etn, a very interesting panic button candidate. Um, You know, he's put up some points because he's getting involved. He's just not putting up the level of points that we're expecting. And the big thing is, you know... James Robinson performing to a level that we were not expecting. He's performing better. But, you know, why were we avoiding James Robinson so hard in the first place? That's what I said last week. Like, stop it. And Cody was like, oh, James Robinson was a what we did. Shut up, Cody. Hot takes guy wins again. Cody's not here to defend himself. That's why I can go so hot at him. Uh, But, yes, Travis Etienne, you know what? I'm not hitting the panic button. He's still a pass catching back in – you know, most people play in PPR leagues now, or at least half point PPR leagues. Mm-hmm. He's going to get some value. James Robinson did steal points from him. He's going to steal carries from him. Um, 
But a lot of James Robinson's points came on one long touchdown run. That play doesn't happen. ETN could have gotten those yards too. I'm not saying I'm thrilled with ETN. I'm not saying he's a must start every week kind of player, but I'm not freaking out on him yet. I think he's going to carve out more of a role as the season goes on. So I'm holding steady with ETN. Man, I so much want to say hit the panic button because I want to be the guy that says, I told you so. James Robinson's got a role in this offense, and I'm still not wrong. James Robinson has a fairly big role in this offense, if anything. You don't see who's supposed to be a backup running back getting 23 carries, no matter what he did with them. Like, he was really not good except for that one long touchdown, like you said. He still only averaged 2.8 yards per carry. But 23 carries tells me that they want him to be used. The only reason I will not hit the panic button on Travis Etienne is because, like you said, he is a pass catching back. Most of us play in PPR. He's still getting close to 50% of the snaps. The Jaguars aren't going to be winning 24 nothing a lot of times. That, that, that Colts game was a little bit of a fluke or just the Colts absolutely falling apart. We're really not sure which, but... It's not going to be the value Travis you, dra- you drafted Travis Etienne for. It's not. He is going to be a 50-50 split guy that's relying on pass catching and touchdowns. And draft value is the exact reason that you have to take into account for the next guy as well. We got DK Metcalf. Uh, look, the dude, if he was getting drafted where he was last season, yes panic completely uh this dude is performing way below his adp but dk fell in some drafts this year because george i'm sorry can you refresh me is uh geno smith still starting for the seahawks Mm, unfortunately yes oh yep that's a problem that's a problem right there uh the only nice thing is it looks like they're still forcing the ball to dk metcalf triple coverage who cares dk down there somewhere like let's (laughs) eat it uh now dk is not you know, getting the separation that he needs to get. Uh, Geno Smith is not getting him the ball as well as he needs to. Um, any Seahawks fans or Geno Smith fans out there, first off, why are you a Geno Smith fan? Stop it. Um, second off, anybody out there that is fans of those are going to be hating me from this podcast from just pooping on Geno Smith so hard, but he's not good, guys. He's not good. As long as he's the quarterback, DK Metcalf is going to be a sketchy play. If you look at a game where the defense isn't as great against wide receiver ones um, or against DK style players, then yeah, go ahead. But look what DK Metcalf is going to be a matchup based play for the rest of the season. If you are thinking of him as an every week starter panic, 100% panic. If you were thinking of him as a flex or, you know, plug and play kind of guy, no, not panicking, Uh, hold steady with him. He's doing exactly what we expected. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing I want to mention as I do this is uh, Tyler Lockett had nine catches for 107 yards on 11 targets this week. So, Tyler, do you remember the saying, is it a DK week or a Lockett week? Oh, every week. I was saying it with my fiance yesterday. Um, When that was happening, was the quarterback Russell Wilson? Um, let me think here. Uh, yeah, yep. It was Russell Wilson. So when you have a Russell Wilson compared to a Geno Smith, that second guy can probably still score you about 10 to 12 points. Maybe he get a touchdown and get you a little more, but like, yeah, he's not going to be super great, but he's going to at least be like playable. And maybe you can call DK playable if you like squint hard enough this week. Four catches for 35 is not really super great. If you're in a PPR, it's like, oh, maybe that was okay. But if it's literally going to be back and forth between Lockett and DK, no, I don't want him in my starting lineup every week. And if you're thinking about as every week starter, yeah, I'm also hitting the panic button. Panicking left and right based off of, you know, what you expected from him. Um, moving right along, we got to get to a, a big one here. A big one, George. Um, we kind of mentioned him a little bit earlier, uh, and that's our big boy, Kyle Pitts. Um, and this one's tough because – you only picture like three or four tight ends being like top tier. It's like you got these tight ends and then everybody else. And Pitts was in that level, meaning you went out and snagged him in the early rounds. If you got one of the everybody else tight ends, then you probably took them late in the draft. You expected two points a week or 10 points based off of how they did. You weren't expecting much. 
who cares? If you drafted up and paid up for one of these big tight ends and you got Kyle Pitts and he is performing nothing, he's doing nothing, sketchy. Uh, it's definitely going to get you shaken a little bit. You can try blaming Marcus Mariota all you want, but look at Drake London out there, the rookie crushing it. Um, and you still have other players on that team The Falcons are putting up points. So it's not the team. It's not the quarterback. It might be the scheme. It might be the player. George, you hit the panic button on Kyle Pitts. <sighs> If you drafted him in those tight ends, even tight ends like five to nine, five to ten, that like you were expecting something out of, but you weren't going to get it. Like, I wouldn't be hitting the panic button yet. Like, ah, this guy was a little sketchy last year, but he had a thousand yards. He just couldn't get in the end zone. It'll turn around. Consensus. He was, by ADP, number three in tight ends. Yes, I'm hitting the panic button. And I'm hitting the panic button because you expected him to be close to the level of a Mark Andrews, close to the level of a Travis Kelsey, being better than Darren Waller, who was supposed to be a sketchy play this year because they added all these different weapons in Vegas. And he's been basically completely invisible. Three three targets. I can find seven targets from tight ends on free agency right now. Three targets. If he was getting targets and not converting them because they were double covering him, yeah, sure. But I'm already a little sketched out about this team passing the ball because as much as I love Marcus Mariota, he's not the greatest passing quarterback. This team is going to be a run first team. And then your top weapon, who is supposed to be your top weapon, is not getting it because it's going to Drake London now. And then three targets again. No, I don't I don't like it. I'm not dropping him. Don't forget that. Like, don't get that. But if you find a tight end on the dartboard with a really good matchup, I would not blame you for sitting Kyle Pitts. And then once you see it, maybe you start getting back on the bandwagon. It's going to piss you off if you bench Pitts and he does finally get you that 25-point week. But mm-hmm. you, you got to remember that last season – you know, Kyle Pitts was very up and down too. Kyle Pitts had very few games where you're like, oh, here we go. It's finally the time. Like, it, it didn't happen very often. Um, you know, I'm pulling up his 2021 stats here. Yeah, we got one game of 22, one game of 20, and then all single digits until week 16, which was 13. Three weeks where he broke 10 points in all of last season. And yet we still drafted him super high, and he has 2.9 and 2.9. Uh, this guy is getting outplayed by Andrew Beck, Chris Myrick, <laughs> Jody Fortson, Ian Thomas, Eric Saubert. Like, I don't know who any of these people are. And yet he is out being outplayed by all of them. He's being outplayed by Taysom Hill, who is currently the 10th ranked tight end. Oh, yeah, Taysom Hill shouldn't be owned anywhere. Shut up, Cody. Proved you wrong again. <laughs> Top 10 tight end right now, Taysom Hill. He's ownable. He's a tight end dartboard throw. Shut up, Cody. Oh, man. (laughs) I still can't see myself starting Taysom Hill, though. (laughs) But if, okay, if you had Kyle Pitts and you have Taysom Hill, the way that both of them have been playing, are you playing Kyle Pitts? I know this sounds dumb, (sighs) but the way they've both been playing... Are you is Alvin Kamara in the lineup next week? If he's in the lineup, I'm probably gonna shakily play Pitts. If he's not in the lineup, they're gonna look for some more carries out of Taysom Hill or scheme something up for him. I'll play Taysom Hill. That's where I'll draw the line. Look, if I'm being honest, my are you panicking button is on don't panic for Kyle Pitts. And here's my only reason why. If Kyle Pitts, you know, was performing the way he was, but every other tight end was crushing it, panicking, absolutely panicking. But Travis Kelsey had a great week one, 22 points. Week two, seven. You know, I understand that's still better than what Pitts is doing, but from Travis Kelsey, a guy you're drafting potentially in the first round, seven, that's not what you expect. Uh, Mark Andrews, yes, this week he had 21. Week one, seven. Uh <laughs> I see a trend. Darren Waller, uh, week two, 14, week one, 10. Like, these are good weeks. But from guys you're drafting in the third or fourth round or first or second round for, you know, a Travis Kelsey, like, you want more than 15 points. You want more than seven points. You want them to consistently be breaking 15 points if you're drafting them that early. So none of the other tight ends at the tops are performing that well. The number one tight end on the entire season only has 36 points. Like it's, 
it's not that impressive. Like it's or not does he have 36 points? That doesn't seem right. Should be less than that. Should be about 30. Yes, 29.7. There we go. 29.7 for the number one tight end. Not even 30. Averaging less than 15 points for the number one overall player at that position. The whole position is struggling. Uh, That's good for the people that waited on tight ends. But if you drafted one of the high ones, at least the other ones aren't killing it either. So not panicking. Still starting pits. He will get involved at some point. Okay, so I have one more tight end to talk about when we finish up our panic button, and I'm going to talk for a second while I pull up these stats because I want to see how he's been doing week one and two. And it's not much better than Kyle Pitts. Now, last year, like I'm going to tie this into Amra St. Brown. We thought that the reason that he had his breakout is because TJ Hawkinson went down and he was basically the only weapon left. They didn't have Swift at that point, whatever. Well, now everyone on that offense is healthy. And TJ Hawkinson has absolutely stumbled over his own feet coming into the season here. This week, he had four points. It was three receptions for 26 yards. Not pretty at all. But he still is second on Detroit in targets this week. Tyler, are you panicking on TJ Hawkinson? Um, no, no, only because again, the tight end position is sucking. It's terrible. Um, just to put it in perspective, um, he was drafted around the same time as tight end Dalton Schultz, who was supposed to be a high draft pick tight end this season. And, you know, just like you said, like some of the stars went down. Some of the big receivers for the Cowboys went down. And we talked about it. Backups and rookies like the target tight ends. So, you know, Cooper rushes in. Dalton Schultz should still perform well. He had 0. 0.8. 0. 0.8 this week. He didn't even break one. Uh, and yet, Dalton Schultz is still outscoring TJ Hawkinson because of a nine-point week in week one. But... It just goes to show you that the tight end position all around is down. Dallas Goddard is a really great tight end. He only had seven in week one. Uh, Everybody out there knows what he did in week two. We don't yet because we're not there yet. But uh, we're talking about a lot of big name tight ends that just haven't quite hit it yet. Um, I would say if the rest of the tight end position starts to build up, they start to get good and you start losing weeks because other tight ends are putting up 20 while yours is putting up two. That's when you start to panic. But when everybody's tight end is only putting up like six or seven points and yours puts up two, they only outscored you by five. You only got to outscore them by five at a different position. I'm not panicking yet. I don't like that. He's not putting up more points, but you still have some room to build. Not panicking. Yeah, and I like like I kind of said, my biggest issue with how Kyle Pitts has been starting so far is that he's not even being targeted in the offense. It doesn't look like the offense wants to run through him. And yeah, TJ Hawkinson is playing second fiddle to Amra St. Brown, but that's it. Second. Like he's still see it still looks like the Lions want to get him involved. He's still some kind of a safety valve for Jared Goff. And an offense that we is already performing way better than it did last year when TJ Hawkinson was a top seven tight end before he had his injury to end the season. So I'm also not panicking yet on TJ Hawkinson. I mean, there's a couple guys around him that are performing better so far. Like you said, Dallas Goddard, we don't know if he's going to pass him or not, but he's he was already pretty close to passing him after just one week. Zach Ertz, despite being limited in week one, is doing better. Pat Fryermuth has had not had a bad start to the season, but He's not like absolutely disappearing from the lineup as I feel like Kyle Pitts is. So I have a little less worry about TJ Hoggins than the Kyle Pitts. I'm not hitting the panic button on this one. All right, guys, there you have it. And if you have any other questions on who to panic, should I panic, please send them our way. It's my favorite segment, so (laughs) I will enjoy it. And because it's my favorite segment, there will be some TikTok videos posted all year long on some extra players we haven't discussed on if you should panic on them or not. So go check us out on TikTok. Give us a like. Give us a follow. Share the videos. Tell your friends. Tell your dog. I don't care. Uh, Just go ahead. Spread the word. Watch the TikToks. It's fun out here, guys. Yes, it is. But you know what else is fun? More football. Let's break down the Thursday night preview before we head out. All right, George, Thursday night preview. We started week one 
with Matthew Stafford versus Josh Allen. Oh, man. All right. Followed it up week two with Justin Herbert versus Patrick Mahomes. All right. And we followed right on streak with week three of Thursday night with Mitch Trubisky versus Jacoby Brissett. <laughs> you barely say that. You barely ah. got that out. <laughs> But that's the excitement we have going into Thursday night. But don't be too mistaken. There's some guys that should be started in this game, even though it is not pretty. And I can start on the Steelers side because Najee Harris got through a game. He looked all right. I mean, he's going against Cleveland. They have a decent defensive front, but I think he's just such a volume monster. He has to stay in your lineup. Deontay Johnson is clearly the number one wide receiver so far. So I think he's in your lineup. And I just mentioned Pat Fryermuth like a minute and a half ago. And he's been pretty solid, so I think he's someone that could slide in your tight end position. Did I miss anybody on Pittsburgh? Nope. No Chase Claypool? Najee Harris. <laughs> Deontay Johnson, Najee Harris, and Pat Fryermuth are your potential options. Other than that, you're kind of waiting and seeing on Pittsburgh. Um, they're not a thrilling team. But on the Brown side, another not thrilling team, but there is one very thrilling player, born the same year as me, so it kind of makes me feel like, crap about myself uh <laughs> nicholas jamal chubb uh this guy pulling out, out middle names again crushing it oh man look nick chubb is one of my favorite players every year and i i, I was talking to my fiance when we were doing mock drafts and i was like i kind of want the 10th pick this year so i can get like you know a Najee harris and nick chubb as the swing picks it'd be great uh, I think it would be solid. Or you can get one of those top receivers and Nick Chubb as the 11th pick. Then here I am looking at mock drafts, watching Nick Chubb fall to the end of the second round, potentially third round. And it's mind blowing to me, but I feel like maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe I'm missing something because Chubb is falling so far. And then in our league of record, somebody went out and got Nick Chubb at like fifth or sixth pick. And pe some people were joking. They were like, what a shocking pick. Meanwhile, I'm sitting back there going, that's a great pick. I love that pick. I would totally do that at five. If I had the fifth pick, I'm taking Nick Chubb. Like, this great pick. <laughs> and I felt like an idiot for thinking, and I was like, I'm going to regret that. Then here you go. Nick Chubb out here crushing it. Absolutely demolishing. He is one of the best players in fantasy. If you got Nick Chubb in the second or third round, you are laughing at your league mates. Laugh in their face the way I've been laughing at Cody this podcast. Uh, tell them they're idiots. I don't care. It's more fun if you talk smack. Uh, so talk some smack to your guys. Nicholas Jamal Chubb. What a legend. You and the middle names. It's That's kind of legendary in itself right there. But, okay. I was going to label this talk reasons I like the Cleveland Browns. But I feel like it's reason I like the Cleveland Browns. Because I can't come up with more than one. Reason I like the Cleveland Browns. They are one of the few teams in the league that has been able to truly, truly support two running backs. Nick Chubb, like you said, absolutely killing it. And on 17 carries. I mean, 17 carries is solid. But like when you're talking about like a guy who we're potentially saying is a first round value, you're saying like, oh, this guy's getting 25 carries. He's a lead back. He doesn't have anyone behind him getting more than like two carries. This team had a guy with 13 and six behind Nick Chubb. And he's still out here scoring a bazillion points. And then Kareem Hunt's the other guy. Yeah, Kareem Hunt does go out there and catch passes, even though he technically caught less passes than Nick Chubb this week, which I think is actually funny. Um, and still getting 13 carries. And this isn't like, yeah, they were up on the Jets for a while, but they just want to run their game through their running backs. The only other team I can think of right now that's using their running backs just as well for fantasy is Green Bay. Because A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones are both getting involved very heavily in that offense. But Cleveland is doing something that very few other people are. And I love both of them. Maybe Hunt's like your secondary kind of sketchy play, but he didn't get a touchdown this week and still had a solid point value. He'll do it again. He'll do it again. And a couple of times he'll get some touchdowns away from Chubb, which will make you hate him for that. But he's going to be a great flex in that week. All right, man, we got Kareem Hunt. We got Nick Chubb. I mean, are you trusting Donovan Peoples-Jones, Amari Cooper, <laughs> David Njoku, any of these guys at all, or are we just kind of out on the rest of the Browns? Um. Okay, so Jacoby Brissett looked serviceable this week. I don't want to say too much more than that. Um, Donovan Peoples-Jones, I kind of laughed at last week. I'm like, hey, he was the leader in targets, and I don't want to touch him. And he had one target for zero catches this week. That was right. What I was wrong about is I said, I'm sorry to Amari Cooper owners. And he goes out there and gets 10 targets, gets a touchdown, 101 yards receiving. 
okay. Pittsburgh has a tough defense. I would probably still try to sit Amari Cooper if you could, because I'm going to try to play him by matchup if I can. But if you're desperate at wide receiver, if you're someone that had Mike Evans, who might have a one game suspension. If you're relying on Chris Godwin coming back at the beginning of the year, if you have someone struggling, you could do worse than playing Amari Cooper. It's just going to be a heck of a roller coaster ride. It is going to be a heck of a roller coaster ride. George, I think that's it for the Thursday night matchup uh, because there's really not a whole lot of fantasy assets <laughs> in this game. Um, and you know what? This whole season is a roller coaster matchup. I mean, you got Tua out there putting up Madden level points. The Giants are good at football. Apparently, the Broncos don't know how to football. It is a weird season. It has been nothing but excitement. They have said it on NFL Red Zone nonstop that this is one of the craziest seasons we've ever seen. Maybe we're overreacting, but it has been thrilling finishes to almost every game. Tons of upsets. Um, And you know what? I am here for every moment of it. But with it being that much of a roller coaster, it is tough to predict. I watched some of the top scoring week one teams put up next to nothing in week two in fantasy football. Don't be that team that's putting up next to nothing. If you need some help, reach out to us. Ask us some questions. If you want to know who to pick up on the waivers or who to panic, or if you're already ready to start trading, that's my kind of person right there. You need to start trading. Uh, let us know. Let us help you out. Let us help you win a championship. Either way, this podcast is more fun for us and more fun for you when you get involved. Yes, it is, Tyler. Thank you all one more time for listening in to the Couch GM's podcast. Cody will be with us later this week to preview week three. <laughs> and the thumbs down from Tyler. But for Tyler Slider, I'm George Kurth, and we'll see you all later in the week. Boom. Oh.